I'm so happy to be here with all of you from here in greater Boston, Israel, and knowing how many people will take any chance they can to learn from Dr. Aviva Zornberg with viewers from around the world. I'm Mark Baker, President and CEO of Combined Jewish Philanthropies, and we are so proud to be hosting this afternoon's Ruderman Synagogue Inclusion Program. I wanna thank our colleagues and co-sponsors at the Rabbinical Assembly. Thank you to my colleagues at CJP who work so hard to make programs like these happen. Uh, and of course, thank you to my dear friends, Jay and Shira Ruderman and Sharon Shapiro and to the Ruderman Family Foundation for leading the way and shining your light in so many ways for all of us. I don't need to tell us that we're here during an incredibly sensitive time. It's been over a year of pandemic that's now behind us, but we're also here during a liminal space of emergence as we prepare to transition back or maybe forward, whatever that transition means. And I can't help but feel like this moment we're in brings hope and fear. It brings eagerness and trepidation, reconnection and disconnection. And these are the range of emotions that Dr. Aviva Zornberg writes so elegantly about. Anxiety, distress, sadness, loneliness, all of these are on the rise as we face a mental health epidemic in our society. I'm so proud that CJP has named this for our community and is already working to ensure that our community addresses it as part of our commitment to see and care for those in our community who are struggling often suffering and often in silence. This year, we've launched a new initiative together with McLean Hospital and Jewish Family and Children's Services to pilot giving free access to virtual cognitive behavioral therapy for members of our community. And this is just one step in our effort to significantly broaden and deepen access to mental health support. And I'm also proud that we see this as part of a larger effort to ensure that everyone in our community can feel a sense of belonging and connection and can find meaning and purpose in Jewish life, accessing the inspiring wisdom and power of Torah and Jewish learning to help make sense and make meaning of our place in the world. And this is precisely what Dr. Zornberg does every time she teaches and writes. I'll let Sharon introduce her for, more formally in a moment but let me just say that my wife, Jill, and I have been learning from our friend, Dr. Zorenberg, for over 20 years since we lived in Jerusalem and studied at the Paradise Institute of Jewish Studies. I don't know of many other teachers who can peel away the layers of Jewish texts and penetrate to the soul, both of the text and her students, making Torah speak to our minds and our hearts more than Dr. Zorenberg does. And while I certainly can't remember every word of every class, I've attended of hers. What I can remember is how it feels when that class is over and you go home afterwards. It is a distinctly moving experience to learn Torah from her and the resonance of that learning lasts for hours, days, sometimes years. Dr. Zornberg, we're so happy to have you with us today. And now I'm happy to introduce my good friend, Sharon Shapiro, a longtime volunteer and leader in our community from a family with a deep commitment to promoting disability inclusion. She has made significant contributions to CJP and organizations throughout our community and the Jewish world through her leadership, including serving on the CJP Board of Directors, the Board of Directors of Gateways Access to Jewish Education, the Chair of the Miriam Fund, and on the Committee on Services for People with Disabilities, and so much more. Sharon will share some remarks, after which Dr. Zorenberg will give her presentation, followed by a brief Q&A Sharon, thank you for being here and for your leadership. I look forward to learning with all of you today. Sharon. Thank you, Mark. Good afternoon and good evening. On behalf of the Ruderman Family Foundation, I'm delighted to welcome all of you to the Ruderman Synagogue Inclusion, Inclusion Project Spring Event, featuring world-renowned author and Torah scholar, Dr. Viva Gottlieb Zomberg, who will discuss mental unease as a factor of the epic, Exodus epic. The Ruderman Synagogue Inclusion Project is proud to sponsor this evening's program, Redemption and the Unquiet Mind in the Exodus Narrative, which will explore, among other things, the different dimensions of trauma, brokenness, pandemic, confusion, emotional dysregulation, and fear our ancestors faced during their exodus from Egypt. We are gathering today during an incredibly challenging time for our country. 
The pandemic has heightened anxiety and depression for so many of us, including those who have never experienced mental health challenges before. As a result, we have all experienced a collective trauma. A few years ago, our Families Foundation noticed a rise in the cases of mental health challenges in the greater Boston Jewish and secular communities, which motivated us to increase our commitment to supporting programs and initiatives focusing on mental health. We are so proud that the Ruderman Synagogue Inclusion Project has taken the lead in supporting synagogues that are working on breaking down the stigma surrounding mental health. In response, congregants are supporting the members in their synagogues who are dealing with mental health challenges. As we still find ourselves in the challenging time of, of COVID, I continue to be impressed by the number of our synagogues, rabbis, and congregants who work tirelessly to provide an incredible array of mental health information virtually to support their congregants and community members. We are especially proud that since September, RCEP has helped 45 synagogues create mental health initiatives in their communities. RCEP is proud to have sponsored much of the creative, innovative, and much needed programming coming out of our synagogues, which has helped and will continue to help so many people. I'd like to thank Mark Baker, Mark Baker Carissa Wolf, Meredith Rusting, and all of the staff at CJP who made today, today's events possible. Now it is an honor to introduce one of the most prolific scholars in the world, Dr. Aviva Zornberg. Dr. Zornberg teaches Torah throughout the Jewish world at synagogues and universities and psychoanalytic institutes. She reads biblical narratives through the prism of midrash, literature, philosophy, and particularly psychoanalysis. She is the author of five critically acclaimed books. Her new book, The Hidden Order of Intimacy, Reflections on Leviticus is forthcoming in March, 2022. When reviewing Dr. Zornberg's masterful book, Particulars of Rapture, Reflections on Exodus, the Washington Post wrote, I know of no other book that presents the enormous subtleties and complexities of rabbinic biblical interpretation with such skill, intelligence, literary flair and sheer in the sheer elegance of style quite simply a masterpiece and now it is a privilege to turn the program over to dr zornberg dr zornberg will you unmute yes okay um, can you hear me now? That's a relief. Perfect. Uh, I just thanked Sharon. And I'm beginning now to make the transition, which is quite a difficult transition, from my involvement in the description of the suffering of the community, of people in the community, which of course is shared here in Israel, is shared worldwide. And between that and the story I want to tell about the Exodus, it's not an exact match. I'm not going to be talking about the contemporary situation, but I am going to be talking about the unquiet mind, which is a beautiful expression, I think coined by K. Reed Jimison, who spoke to you in the previous lecture. It's an extraordinary book. She's an extraordinary person. I've read many of her books um, and I feel somewhere saturated with what she tries to convey, what she conveys so successfully. What I want to suggest now, this afternoon, this evening, I want to suggest that the unquiet mind is the lot of all of us. That to be a human being is to have an unquiet mind, that there's something inherent in the mind that is unquiet. The mind doesn't sit down and rest, maybe very occasionally. And that's what we call, you know, the peaceful mind. It's, it's an occasional experience. But on the whole, the restless mind, I'm changing the word now from unquiet to restless, which is not so negative. Uh, the restless mind is actually a function of creativity. It's a function of actually being working all the time to create meaning, working on difficult material to create meaning, resistant material. Meaning doesn't pop up just when you want it. Meaning is often very elusive. It doesn't appear on cue. And when we read a story, like the story in the Torah, about the redemption from Egypt, 
the word redemption already tells us that this is a story that ends happily. And so it seems to signal that we move out of whatever unquietness there was into a peaceful stretch. After that, we are redeemed. Of course, if you read the Torah, if you've read the, throughout the five books of Moses, you'll know that that's far from a true picture. The people emerge from Egypt and immediately start grumbling, immediately express their restlessness, their unquietness, which continues basically throughout the whole journey in the wilderness, 40 years of unquietude. Now, is that, what, how are we to think of that kind of unquietude? Um, the story of the Exodus, the story of that redemption in itself, is the quintessential story of the Torah. It's the story. It's the story that is actually a commandment. It's the story that God commands Moses that you should tell this story of what happened in Egypt to your children and to your grandchildren, and you shall know that I am God. Now, that sets up a whole agenda for the future, telling the story of the disquiet of Egypt, how I tormented Egypt. That's the way it's put. I hardened Pharaoh's heart. It's chapter 10, verse 1, if you have a, a chumash in front of you. I hardened his heart, and I want you to tell, as I played with the I tormented Egypt, in order that you should tell the story to your child and your grandchild, and you shall know that I am God. So there is the commandment of telling the story with its obvious purpose, which is to communicate the story to the future, to your child and your grandchild. That's pretty plain, except that there is this strange sense of alternative purpose. It's not just, why is it so important to tell the story in order to know that I am God? Otherwise, if you don't tell the story, you will not know. Now, there's something about this that catches the ear of one of the great Hasidic masters, the Svatimid, in the first passage on your page. And he catches it and he plays with it. He starts doing the essential thing that I want to suggest is, is the meaning of a, a positively restless mind. What does a positively restless mind do? A healthy restless mind do? It plays. It doesn't, it doesn't accept things as, in, oh, I'm sure they know what they mean. It tries, it notices what doesn't make sense and tries to do something with it. It's always working on things. And what is the, what is the point of the work here? That you will know that I am God. And the Svatimet puts it like this, quite challengingly. It's not that you start off after your experience in Egypt, to his, Moses talking to his generation. Um, you had, a, you had a, an in, enormous experience in Egypt, and so you know certain things, and I want you to tell your children about what you know. It's not like that. That's too common sense. It's that whatever you know, it's not knowing that I'm God. It's an unquiet knowledge. It's a, it's a chaotic knowledge. You went through something here. You went through a trauma. In order to know something, you have to tell a story about it. It's the telling the story that tells you, never mind your child and your grandchild, that's almost secondary. The first thing is you tell a story in order to achieve some sense of meaning, to, achieve, to, to get somewhere. So telling a story is a mitzvah, it's a commandment, because we are dealing with difficult material always. When we deal with the material of life, of what has just happened to you, it's always difficult, and sometimes more difficult than others. The experience for the Israelites of leaving Egypt was not an easy experience, but much more so. Who really has the unquiet mind? And now I'm going to make a sharp, sharp shift. I'm not going to be interested at first in the mind of the Israelites, in our experience of unquietness. I'm going to be interested in the mind of Pharaoh. That's my interest. Because after all, his mind, the word in Hebrew is heart, <laughs> lev paro. That's a word that means both the mind and the heart, as mind sometimes does as well. Mind includes the whole emotional apparatus. It's everything. Pharaoh's mind gets extraordinary attention 
in the story of the plagues. The Israelites leaving Egypt means a very turbulent and tormented time in the mind of Pharaoh. And that seems to concern the narrative extremely. We keep coming back to Leif Paro, what God does to Pharaoh's heart, to Pharaoh's inner life, that God hardens his heart. And what happens every time Moses comes to announce a plague, Pharaoh goes through a strange, tormented zigzag. On the one hand, he hears the advanced news uh, of the plague, and he is full of bravado, and God hardens his heart. And then the plague happens, and he softens. You know, he's, he, 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 he liquefies, he's full of fear and, and pain, and he, he's very happy when Moses turns up, and he makes demands of Moses, requests of Moses, and he's all ready to give in. But as soon as things change, Moses, uh, Pharaoh's heart changes. So the constant volatile movement of Pharaoh's heart is really the center of the story. The only way we can escape from an interest in that heart is by saying, well, Pharaoh is really just, we should think of him not as having a heart, as having an inner life at all. We should think of him as a kind of Punch and Judy show. But there he is, he is Punch, and Judy is constantly knocking him down, and he's struggling to his feet, and a bit of bravado and a bit of that, but he's not really human. You know? He's just a puppet. And he's there to make us feel good about how he tries in vain to resist God's, God's uh, claim, God's call. And every time he's knocked down and goes through this oh, time and time again. And really the idea perhaps is, as Mayor Sternberg says, to raise the handicap, to give God or the author of the story um, even greater credit and prestige for telling a wonderful story that gets longer and longer and, ke and keeps your interest because you know in the end there's going to be triumph. You know, it's that kind of primitive story, a very primal story we're talking about here. And in the end, he's crushed, right? That would be that kind of story. But I want to suggest that if the Torah refers no fewer than 17 times, someone counted it, <laughs> I didn't, 17 times to the heart of Pharaoh, then the Torah wants us to have an interest in the heart of Pharaoh, in his vicissitudes. What is that mysterious changing of mind that happens all the time? He gives in and then he stiffens again. And there are three words used for that hardening of heart. Kashe, chazak, and kaved. Three, three words that may be synonyms, they may not be synonyms. There are people who try to see a system in the whole story, divide it up into sections and see how he really does change. But I would suggest that's being too sophisticated. What the story is giving us is a kind of repeated, um, it's a repeated um, farce almost, of someone who after all does have an inner life. And how are we to understand that inner life? And we are to tell the story. That story is what we are to tell of what God did to Pharaoh. And through that, you'll get to some important knowledge about yourselves. Pharaoh is not distinct from you. He is not a puppet. He is not a punch and duty show. He is someone who is playing out something about the meaningless movements of the human soul mind, how we can't hold an idea in mind long enough to actually act on it, how we're always zigzagging away, how the past, our past fidelity to someone can be forgotten in a moment. I'm thinking of Mozart's opera, Cosi Fan Tutti, um, in which Fernando, as he is about to betray his original true love, um, He's singing an aria to the new lady, and, and suddenly in his mind, uh, in his mind, but what we hear is music that was the music of his original commitment to his first love. And so we are faced there with that kvidutalev, suddenly the, the, the resistance of, of, of a soul to its most important memories, to its most important past, how that can disappear and then perhaps sometimes reappear, all the non-rational ways in which we work. Now, in, that's the story we're supposed to tell. And it's a story that's supposed to end happily, of course, because stories end happily. And we're waiting for the conclusion. 
We're waiting to see, does Pharaoh ever see the light? I would suggest that that's something I've always been looking for. I don't know about, about you. I'm not satisfied to have Pharaoh destroyed. I don't, to me, that's, that's, that's a kind of primitive story. So that dragon, you keep on jumping, chopping off his head and he keeps growing a new head and it makes you even more anxious to destroy him in the end. You know, so in the end, he's thoroughly destroyed. I want a story. And I think the Torah gives us grounds for wanting a story about someone who is a human being like ourselves, to understand what goes on in that mind and to enjoy perhaps his seeing the light. Does he ever get it? What we read in the text over and over again, each time he hardens his heart, is that he didn't listen. Lo shama. He didn't listen to what Moses was asking of him, to the demand of God, to the demand of the Israelites. He's someone who is very obdurate. He knows how to block himself from listening. And then he knows how to soften, perhaps under fear, under the impact of fear. What we want is a final act of conversion. What I want is a final opening somewhere to that he should know God, that he should really know something. Does it happen or doesn't it happen? And to cut a long and fascinating story short, because I don't have the time to go into the details of the text, it would be wonderful just to go through it in the text. What you find on the one hand is God telling Moses ahead of time even before the story of the plagues begins, back at the burning bush, God tells Moses, you go and make the claim for freedom on Pharaoh. And I know that he will not listen to you and he will not let you go. In other words, God foretells that though Moses has to do his best to get to Pharaoh, God is already putting it on record ahead of time. He is not going to listen. I know him. In the end, it's not only that I know him, but God interferes with his heart. God actually hardens his heart. And I want to have a word to say about that later. But what we have now is God foreseeing from the beginning and telling Moses, you work hard at it, at, at, this, at this appeal to, to Pharaoh, but you should know ahead of time, his heart will not relent. He will not listen. And this goes on even till the moment when Pharaoh apparently finally really gives in. That is the night of the firstborn. The night of the firstborn, Pharaoh, it says, um, it's, um, one moment, the night of the firstborn. Um, ha have a look at, uh, have a look at the, uh, the source in number, in number two. Pharaoh wakes up in the middle of the night, gets up in the middle of the night, and he goes calling out for, for Moses. Where are Moses and Aaron? Why? Because all the firstborn are dying. So he's in some kind of panic, despair. His mind is exceedingly unquiet, but not unquiet enough, I have to add, um, as one of the Hasidic masters uh, whimsically says, for him to have had any disturbed sleep. He has been sleeping in bed and he gets up from his bed. Rashi actually points that out. You would expect him to have been disturbed enough to be sleepless, but no, he enjoys a good sleep. And then he wakes up and he thinks, oh, I have to put an end to this, it's midnight. It's midnight and it's, it's, it's too much. And so he looks for Moses and then he gives in on every point. This is the first time we think, right, he's got it. Right, he's on every point he's yielding. Number two in the text, Serve God as you have spoken. What is as you have spoken? Everything as you have said it and not as I have said it. In other words, it's an ideological surrender. It's not just I give in, I don't want to die, but everything shall be as you say and not. The story is your story. My story was a spurious, defensive story. It will just fall by the wayside. Batel, cancel, delete. Everything I said when I was resisting, cancel, 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 all the various stages of his resistance. Um, and your story is the right story. And not only that, your sheep and your cattle you can take with you. Why? Because that's what you said. At one point in the story where I was resisting you, you said to me with what I could only call chutzpah, you said to me very insolently, not only are we going to take our children, 
but you are going to give us your own cattle, your own sheep and cattle um, for, uh, for, for sacrifices in the wilderness. In other words, you really, you really, that was bravado on your part. And now I agree to it. I agree to that too. I give in to everything your story and not my story. And not only that, everything as you have spoken, again, another expression of that, and bless me too. Pray for me, Rashi says, because I am vulnerable, because I am a firstborn. So it's a kind of existential angst, fear of God. Some kind of real fear of God takes, takes him over at this moment. And he asks for Moses' prayers. Now that sounds like a very satisfactory conversion narrative, you might say. Except that, as the Orachayim points out in the next passage, and I'm not going to look at it in any detail, God had warned Moses ahead of time, you know, he still is not going to listen to you. Even when he seems to be totally surrendering, he will change his mind yet again, and he will run after you to the Red Sea. So there is then that it's really high drama if you read it like this, that God is raising the handicap over and over again. And in the end, it actually never gets resolved because the only resolution is that the Egyptians go down in the sea. And according to one intriguing Midrashic tradition, except Pharaoh, that Pharaoh survives to tell the story to those who are still alive in, in Egypt. That is as if we really, really insist on having him in some way see the light, but it's not there in, in the narrative of the Torah. The narrative in the Torah ends with sheer destruction. That's the story we are to tell. It's a story in which there is no closure. That's what I want to say. It's a strange story in which there is no satisfactory closure which is what we want. That's what that's the nature of a traditional story, that they live happily ever after. And that means there are certain requirements and the requirements don't seem to work here. And what I'm interested in now and what we want to pursue together is what happens in Pharaoh's mind. Right, I'll be following this for a little while and then we'll get back to, to the Israelites. What goes on in Pharaoh's mind that in some way represents the human mind in general? Pharaoh as an example of what can happen psychologically in a human mind to prevent that mind from moving, from being active. That is, it's an unquiet mind that doesn't actually create anything, that doesn't make meaning at all. And here I'm thinking of the classic narrative, the kind we all like, the conventional narrative, as a kind of cliche, which the Torah does not commit. The Torah doesn't mean, doesn't tell you a cliche story, and it doesn't want you to tell a cliche story. You know, we were in trouble and God brought us out and everything is now wonderful. You know, there are so many things for the active mind immediately to think about. I, I don't even want to start because <laughs> it would be endless. So what do we mean by telling a story that's not a cliche? Adam Phillips, the, the British psychoanalyst, who has written wonderfully intriguing and epigrammatic books in psychoanalysis, says that what the patient does in analysis, and perhaps what we should do more often, is to refuse ourselves the conventional satisfactions of narrative. Not to go straight for that happy bottom line, and rather tolerate, learn to tolerate anti narrative, an anti-narrative. Now that's an intellectual concept. Anti-narrative, to put it simply, is what the patient does when he is free associating. He remembers this and he remembers that and it's a jumble and there's no particular order. It doesn't, right, he's lying there if he's lying on the couch and he's just allowing the stream of associations to go through him that has no rhyme or reason. It has no form. And therein lies hidden meaning. The meaning that's not the obvious course of events that leads to a happy ending. If you have a story that has a happy ending, why would you want to tell it again? In other words, you know it ended happily. So why tell it over and over again? It, in order to know God, what do you know more every time you tell a hackneyed story? A story that children love hackneyed stories. But that's probably for reasons of security, that they like knowing that everything is stable, 
happens. Nothing, nothing changes. So the redemption is not, in that sense, an apocalypse. It's not the end of the world. The world doesn't come to an end at this point, as we know. The real apocalypse, the real end of the world, messianic time, however we, we name it, then things really will change. Then you will see that, that that is a real ending, but that has never been in history, not in history. And, and we're dealing here with history. And now I want to suggest that what we're dealing with is the phenomenon of Pharaoh, the Pharaoh phenomenon, which is part of life. It's part of how a human being can be. And what we're dealing then with then is a subject that uh, Ernest Becker, in his wonderful book, The Denial of Death, I think it's a classic of the 20th century, The Denial of Death, this is what he argues. He argues that it's the fear of death and the denial of that fear, that's that double movement, yes, that creates all of human culture and all of human civilization. Our meanings arise out of that fear and our refusal to face that fear. And I want to suggest that that is actually a very acute portrait of Pharaoh in the extreme. Do you remember that scene where Pharaoh, um, God, God tells Moses to go down to meet Pharaoh by the river, Lech Hayora. Go and meet him out there by the river. And Rashi makes a really uh, scurrilous, I don't know what the word is, a really un, unintimate, <laughs> uh, intimate, too over-intimate, comment. Why by the river? Why go out there and meet him by the river? Because Pharaoh construes himself, creates himself as someone who has no needs, tzrachim, no bodily needs. And therefore, when he needs to evacuate his body, he goes down early in the morning to the river where no one knows and no one sees. So the rest of the day, he can sit in perfect dignity without needing to turn aside, as it were. This is absolute presence. This is, in fact, animated by shame, kalon. The shame, the fear of the shame of having holes in your body, changing from one minute to the other, on the one hand being a dignified, stable, static presence, on the other hand needing to go somewhere. <laughs> The idea of having holes in the body that make you needy, that make you have to change your state from time to time. And that is caught here in one snapshot in Rashi's, in Rashi's text. Pharaoh hardens his heart as a kind of attempt to close up his body, to make his body dense and impermeable, impermeable and impervious. You have a whole range of wonderful words in English for this. Uh, Becker calls this narcissistic inflation. So it's actually a very good phrase, meaning you're feeling so weak and so fragile and so light, cull, the unbearable lightness of being. I'm really nothing if I have that function that rules my body, that I can't, I can't rule out in any way. I can't control. Um, if I have that, then I need to make myself very heavy. I need to fill myself full of hot air, whatever, to close all my apertures, as if I don't have any openings in the body. Um, that, that somewhere is the joke, right? That is the the skit skit like joke of you know the man the man in the in the in the, in the coattails who slips on a banana peel. There he is, all puffed up and pompous, and he slips on the banana peel. And Moses confronts Pharaoh in that state. And the Midrash goes on to say things like this, at random, that Pharaoh, eno machnis ve eno motzi. I'll just throw them at you. He doesn't bring things into his body. He doesn't take things out of his body. He doesn't eat. He doesn't do the opposite in public. Meaning these, these functions are functions of a disgraceful humanity, of a light humanity. And he has to close himself up. Also says, ose atzmo eloha. Pharaoh makes himself into a god. And we see now how this can be interpreted in these terms. You make yourself, as it were, meta-human, which means without needs. Jews make a bracha over the tzrachim, over the needs of their body. 
about how God created us with holes and cavities. Nakavim, nakavim, chalulim, chalulim. It's really it's quite something when you think about it, that we refer precisely to those openings in the body, and we say we couldn't exist for one moment in your presence, O oh God, as spiritual and dignified beings, if one of the ones, the, if the, any of these openings should be blocked, or any things that are blocked should be opened up. In other words, you made us a strange and wonderful mixture of openness and closeness, of masterfulness and vulnerability. But Pharaoh doesn't feel doesn't feel that. Pharaoh feels that he has to be a god if he is to be if he is to be at all. And <clears throat> excuse me. And it's not only, of course, those holes in the body that have to be closed up, but I'd like to say the ears and the eyes and the mouth. The ears, he doesn't hear. And that becomes not just a part of the plot. He doesn't listen to Moshe and he doesn't give in. It becomes almost an adjective. It's a way of describing Pharaoh. Pharaoh is a non-hearer. You try to talk to him, he's a block. He's a sphinx. It's even there in the Egyptian the idea of the sphinx. Total self-possession. Ramban says, how do we know he's not really listening? He doesn't say I'm not listening. How do we know he's not listening? And translates listening very beautifully. He says, Hushomea Vishotek. He really does hear. He can't help hear. But he doesn't say anything. He doesn't respond. He doesn't open his mouth to react in any way. And that is true for most of the time of the plagues. He is bombarded with sufferings and he can't bring out of himself anything to say when he is resisting. When he is res resisting, he doesn't express himself. He doesn't have that wherewithal. What I want to suggest further than this is that Pharaoh is a self-destructive character. That it's not just that he is somehow mysteriously, mysteriously resistant. How is it that he can resist so, so much when he's suffering so much? You would think he would get it after a while. There's something mysterious about this kind of resistance. And I'm taking my, this, this notion from a contemporary philosopher and, and, and psychoanalyst, uh, Jonathan Lear, who says he is the type of person who attacks his own mind. He doesn't want to let his mind work. And therefore, there's a kind of self-destruct. He doesn't allow himself to play, to move. He is rigid. It's a kind of law of rigidity, and that's a kind of madness. There's a kind, now we're using the word madness. The sheer, actually quite clean word madness. I know it may be offensive to some people when we're talking, not talking about villains. You know, it's, it's a word that I'd like to apply to all human beings. I want to say there's always a potential for madness in us. And we know it. We know it in certain moods where we do or don't somehow yield to certain forms of, of stiffening. Of, 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 um, of refusing that essential motion that Judaism calls, Jewish sources call in a word, tshuva, for instance. What is tshuva, return, repentance? It involves movement. It involves somewhere knowing where you are and turning back, acknowledging your humanity and doing that rather undignified thing of letting go of doing something else. Now that is something that this, this kind of rigidity, this, this impossibility of movement is something that afflicts all political leaders. This is a comment from the Hamik Davar, 19th century um, uh, commentary on the Torah. And he quotes a verse from the book of Job, Messir Lev Roshe Am Haaretz. God is the one who moves, no, not moves, removes the wits, right? the lave, the heart, the mind, makes the leaders of the people, Rashi Am Haaretz, the people's, leaders of the peoples of the earth, lose their mind. That God makes them lose their mind and he makes them wander in, in the chasm, Betohu, in the emptiness and void, Lelo Derech, without a clear path. In other words, God makes political leaders go crazy. Now, 
here we're going to have to face this question of God interfering with the human mind. I think what he's pointing out is something that we can all understand, that there is a great temptation which is yielded to, in our day, almost has become a fashion to yield to it, of power-mad leaders, of populist leaders, in a sense, who can't, who are infatuated with power and hold on to it obsessively. There is simply no way of giving in. There's no, it's within, why? Because God, is, God, has done, God has cast a spell on them. That would be the, the obvious reading of the verse. But what I'm about to suggest is, and I'm here I'm uh, taking, for, taking something from Shmuel David Luzzato, great 18th century, very literary and psychological commentary on the Torah, who says that, that expression that God hardened his heart really means just, it's just religious language for the mysterious and the incomprehensible rigidity and obstinacy of a human being. When a person gets overtaken by a kind of obstinacy and a kind of um, obduracy, stubbornness, that other people just can't understand anymore, you know, how can he be so thick? How can he be so obtuse? Then we say in religious language, God did it to him. It's like God gives people pregnancy gives women pregnancy. That's the religious way of putting it. Otherwise, you might just say she became pregnant. When you're dealing with a mystery of a, a, a previously barren woman becoming present, pregnant, then you'll say God did it. Similarly here, when you're dealing with a mystery of a, hard, a, a heart that hardens itself constantly, even in spite of its fear, and perhaps because of its fear, its fear Ramban says, what's his pattern? He's afraid and he stiffens himself. As he is afraid, his fear leads him to stiffen himself, to resist meaning. And that sense, therefore, um, that sense of Pharaoh's heart leads Jonathan Lear to say, or he not, he's not talking about Pharaoh, but he does, he talks about psychoanalysis in general. And he says, taking off on Aristotle's statement about how philosophy begins in wonder, that the movement of the philosopher begins in an experience of wonder about the world. And Lear says then, psychoanalysis begins in wonder that the unintelligibility of events does not arouse more wonder. That is, what makes you interested in psychoanalysis? What got Freud interested in this way of thinking? Is his sense that he alone seemed to notice how unintelligible events are, the crazy things that happen and the unintelligibility of the human beings that, that, that create those events, that it's not rational. There is a tragic irrationality in the human mind. And that's what starts him off on his quest and there's a kind of sense of wonder that people go around in a kind of daydream thinking that the human mind is rational. How come they're not noticing all these, the darkness that exists in the human mind? And with this, we come to the people, us. And we come to the moment when uh, at the beginning of, at the beginning of chapter 10, God says to Moses, that's where we started, Bo el paro, come to Pharaoh. Not go out to the river, but come in to Pharaoh. Bo, it's always the word for entering an inner space. Enter a house. So you can take it on the concrete level, go into his palace, go where he really lives, go in there and talk to him there. The strange thing though, is that there's no message given, just go because I've hardened his heart. You should know that I've hardened it. So why are you going? Are you going to tell him something? Apparently not. So what I want to put on the table now is an extraordinary other meaning that is quite, is not completely uh, exotic. You will find it in Hasidic writings, which reads, Bo el para, enter into his innermost depths. You, Moses, have to try to go there, penetrate into those, you know, like a psychoanalyst in a sense, into the unconscious of Pharaoh. Why? Because it's relevant to you. 
it's not just some kind of clinical interest in the villain and in the pathologies of his mind. It's an understanding that it's important for you to know in a way what to avoid, but it's, I don't think that's a little too easy to know what to avoid. It means that you are going to have inner demons, unconscious forces in you that will make you like Pharaoh unless you become aware. Now, when God says this to Moses, it's just before the last three plagues. Um, and all these three plagues are plagues of darkness. Rabbi Tzadok Cohen, one of the great 19th century Hasidic masters, uh, a very radical reader of the, of the Torah, notes this, that the, the, the third plague from the last is locusts, in which the eye of the whole world was darkened, was covered over. No, you couldn't see anything because the air was thick with locusts. Then there was the plague of darkness proper. And then there is the night of the firstborn, which is at midnight. The, the, the plague at midnight in deep dark. And so you have three plagues of darkness and an attempt to understand what these symbolize, what, what they mean. Perhaps the suggestion is that they refer not to a general darkness that falls over Egypt, a kind of fog, you know, a thick fog of darkness, but an individual darkness. Each person carries his own darkness with him. Each person carries his own conflicts, his own lack of meaning, his own chaos somewhere inside his or herself. There's a personal choshev. The description is that the three days of darkness were that they couldn't see each other, but not only that, they couldn't get up from their place. Ishmi tachtav. I could follow here the, the, follow, the meaning of tachtav. <laughs> what the king sits on, going back to that enol theme that we had before. That is, each person is sitting there rigid, covering that up and can't move at all, can't get up. In other words, as one of the commentaries suggests, why emphasize this immobility? Because that is the real plague. It's not just that you can't see, but you can't move, that you're arrested in place somewhere, in denial, in repression, right? In, in, in denying what is actually the anxiety that's, that's actually there. Uh, the expression we use in the Haggadah, when we talk about one of the plagues or a group of plagues being Mishlachat Malachei Ra'im, it's a very mysterious expression. Uh, a deputation of evil angels. As if, you know, some kind of mythic, you know, fog of angels came to immobilize Pharaoh and, and his people and so on. And the understanding of this, according to Haktab Lakbala, is mental illness. That is, it's the inner plague of all kinds of evil forces, as it were. I, I don't want to, it's a, it's a bit ticklish, this, but a sense of being arrested by forces that are other than me, that they are not really me. There's a kind of otherness about it. Certainly in, in the case of bipolar, uh, which Kay Reed Jim, Jimison was, was, was writing about, uh, I was looking at the book again this week, um, certainly that's the way she felt. It was an otherness that took her over, became her, but not really her. And so what we have then is a very personal sense of the unconscious, I want to say, and a personal sense that Pharaoh is important to us because where he goes, we could go to. Somewhere that he represents something, that we have that capacity in ourselves. And the idea that you have in, in what we call the Tochacha in, in the book of Deuteronomy, that the warning about the Egyptian sickness, the sickness of Egypt, beware that you don't catch that Egyptian sickness, which is incurable. And we have it actually immediately after the redemption. God says to Moses, people, if you will really listen to my voice, and there we have, if you will retain the opening in your body to be vulnerable and to do something with what you hear, then you will not, I will not put upon you the Egyptian sickness. Machalat Mitzrayim. It's mysterious, really unexplained what it means. And I'm suggesting that we're talking about the Pharaoh phenomenon. 
We're talking about the phenomenon of this kind of intransigence, irrational intransigence. What might the healing for that be? And here I want to look with you at what I think of as a, a central and, and um, generative midrash. It's a midrash that takes us very far. And you can see it in number five on your page. Pharaoh rejects the Israelites contemptuously and dismissively when they come, when they ask for freedom. Yes, when, when, when God, if Pharaoh says, they're crying out to me, you know, to let, to let them go. And, and he says, instead, I'm let bring the work down even harder and even heavier upon them, upon these people to teach them that they shouldn't pay attention to empty things, to empty ideas. They are very easily um, uh, illumined, very, very easily go up in fire. What's the word I want? <laughs> yeah. it, it, it's very easy to, to set fire to these people. Let them forget about all these fancy ideas. I'll just crush them with heavier work. Notice the heavy, the heavy motif. I'm going to hold them in place so that they're not moving. What is it that annoyed Pharaoh so much? And here you have a midrashic imagining. The Israelites had in their hands Megillot. In their possession, they held scrolls, which they, with which they used to mishta'ashe'in. Interesting word. They used to mishta'ashe'a. They used to play. Sha'ashua is play, delightful play, the play of a child. What you have in your English translation is I have to say, um, unacceptable, um, if I'm teacherish about it, um, it regale, your, regale themselves. <laughs> it's not regale yourself. That sounds very peaceful. Just enjoy yourself. L'hishtashea is, is active. It's, it's, it's reflexive, what's more. It's taking the contents of reality and the contents of your mind and playing with them, finding a way of moving around them on making them come alive. So they would read these scrolls, but they didn't read them. They played with them, with what was written in the scrolls from Shabbat to Shabbat. And the content of the scroll was, the meaning of the scroll was that God would redeem them because they rested on Shabbat. So you have a sense that Shabbat, which according to the Midrash, was a grudging offer by Pharaoh to the people. Moses pressed God, uh, sorry, Moses pressed Pharaoh uh, to give them Shabbat off because it would be good for productivity. And so he gives them Shabbat off. But what do they do with the day? They do rest, but it's a kind of unquiet rest. They are mishta asheya. They're resting productively in a different sense, in a sense that can only be spiritual. They're, they're doing something very active and imaginative. And when we get to that, then Pharaoh is Pharaoh recognizes his enemy. He recognizes a danger. That kind of lightness, that kind of creativity, right? that kind of, I'll say a little more about it in a moment, that is something that I can't tolerate at all. So he takes away Shabbat. I see that rest for them has a very strange meaning, which, is, which threatens my whole regime. It threatens what I stand for. And that then becomes, so Shabbat is taken away from them, so they shouldn't rest. Now, this movement of Sha'ashua, of playing, is the key, at least for one of the great British psychoanalysts, Donald Winnicott, famously called one of his books, his most important book, Playing and Reality. And he regards the movement of play of a child as the first step of movement into the world away from the mother, away from an absolute attachment, being part of the mother, out into the world, facing reality, but combining reality, right, in a kind of intermediate space between the imaginative bliss, right, of being with the mother and the hard fact of reality, of being out there and knocking yourself against hard objects and so on. And that intermediate stage, he calls it the transitional phase of development. It's from there that all culture is born. Art and philosophy and religion, everything comes out of that space, which is the space of play, which is a space in which you acknowledge reality 
And at the same time, you can give imaginative play, free reign, to your, for instance, your omnipotence. It doesn't hurt if you play games of omnipotence. In fact, you should play games of omnipotence. If a child doesn't, then you begin to worry. Because that is part of the important impulses of that tohu inside oneself, the child inside oneself that never goes away. If you don't play at omnipotence, then perhaps you end up by being Captain Ahab in, in, in Moby Dick. You know, putting it into actual reality, you know, becoming a pharaoh figure, as it were, a, a heavy figure of absoluteness. And that wild area, it's wild and yet with some sense of reality, is a way of talking about tohu vavohu, you know, it's, which is retained within our world. The unconscious is retained within our adult mature, conscious, controlled world in which somewhere it's still there. And here uh, there's a notion um, that I'd like to share with you. It's, uh, I found it in, in the Ishbitz line in the Beit Yaakov, Rabbi Yaakov Liner of, of, of Ishbitz, another 19th century uh, master, who says there are areas in experience which are areas of unmeaning. They're areas of wildness. They're areas of the unconscious. One is the sea as opposed to settled land. Yeah. Yeshuv. In, in the Yeshuv, in civil, is, there is civilization. Everything can be built there. The mind is rational and purposeful. And, but there is the sea also. We now are never allowed to forget that there is that otherness. And if you ever go sailing on the sea, and if you make a life of that, certainly, then you get several psalms dedicated to you. <laughs> because these are psalms about the terror of otherness, which is there, is part of the world. The same with the night and the day. The night and the, the time of darkness and the time of light. We live in the light mostly. We want to understand things. We want to make meaning. But if we have totally forgotten about night, then we have forgotten half of existence. What happens at night? At night, one sleeps. One sleeps, one closes one's eyes, one closes one's ability. Right? So there you are, sealed up in yourself, in a way, and pray to all those anxieties, to everything that has come up during the day and has now planted itself inside you and demands to be made something of. But before it can be made something of, you have to experience what Virginia Woolf called that jar on the nerves, right? This was her ambition in writing her books, to give us the sense of that jar on the nerves, which happens before anything can be made of it. That is, it's that moment which is not able, you're not able to make a story of it as it happens because it's something that happens and it sweeps you away. Right? That is the movement of the unconscious. You are, there's no control over it at all. And that jar, right, that's the moment in which you realize the limitations of reason. The lim when you're thinking about it afterwards, perhaps, you realize the limitations, and then you begin to deal with that out of orderness, with th that sense of things not being regulated, and you face it. You, don't, you, you acknowledge that it's there. You don't pretend it's not there. You remember the dream in as far as you can. And perhaps just by having given free play to it at night, some kind of, some kind of equilibrium is, is restored during the day. But we can't dream all the time. So perhaps there are reveries. There's daydream, daydreams. And, or there are poet, there's poetry. There's a way of engaging with the night existence, even during the day. And with this, I want to come to the last question that I want to put on the table. And that is the question of when did redemption happen for us? What was the end? When, what was the timing of the end of the story? And there are two versions given in the Torah. One is that God brought you out by night. That's a quotation. And the other is that they left the land of Egypt with their hands high before the eyes of all Egypt. In other words, by day. When everyone could see them walking out, they're not slinking out of Egypt shamefacedly. Uh, in the Midrash they say, are we thieves? 
that we should go out by night. No, we will be here till full daylight so that we leave before the eyes of everyone. So from our point of view, that's a very satisfactory emergence into the closure of the story. And we have put all kinds of shadows behind us and there we are in the daylight. But there is the other story. And this is the last moment that I want to focus on now. How are they to spend that night? Do they leave during that night? Actually, they don't leave. They're not allowed to leave their houses. That's one of the things that's, that's, that's said very clearly. No one shall cross the threshold during that night until the light of day. What are you doing in your houses all night? You are eating the Korban Pesach in a statuesque pose with your, like, like Madame Tussaud, like a waxwork. You shall eat it with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, your stick, your stick in your hand, ready to go. And you shall eat it in chipazon. Now that's going to carry a lot of weight for us, that word now. Chipazon is haste, panic haste, Rashi says. Bahala. If you want to see the Rashi, it's there on your page. Uh, number six, behala umehirut, panic haste. Pa behala is trauma. Behala is is vertigo. Yeah. It's it's losing your your steady sense of things. That's how you to, you are to eat the the, the sacrifice pesach hu lashem. That's the text. It is a pesach to God, but what is a pesach? We don't know what the word Pesach means. I mean, we will know. The text will explain it to us very shortly. The word Pesach, we get afterwards, a few verses later we read, two verses later. Ufasachti, I will pass over you during that night, yes? And you will not be subject to plague. In other words, I will pass over your houses as I'm plaguing all the other houses. What do you mean by Passover? Passover, that's why we call the festival Passover. But that's now. Now, after we've read that verse, then we know that that's what Passover refers to. But the first time it's mentioned, it's mentioned in the context of panic haste. And we don't know what the word means at all. And I suggest that that's a way of give, putting us face to face with the silence that is inherent within words. That we think, if, if we are literate, we know the meaning of words. But every now and then we come across a word that we are blocked by. And suddenly it's as if there's a white paint slashing across the uh, the painting. And you cut what, what? And you realize that in some way you're in the dark, that language only pretends to make meaning, that it somewhere covers for something. But here I have a word, well, what does that mean? And what it means is, again, like chipazon, I want to say, it's a very undignified movement on the part of God, if I put it like this. This is not the dignified God, the God who goes from house to house in a regulated, determined manner, and then comes upon an Israelite house and goes, whoops, I'll, I'll skip that one. It's hopping and skipping. That's what Rashi says. Lashon dilug upsicha. Kvitsa, kvitsa. Hopping, skipping, jumping. You know, there's a whole range of words for it in Hebrew as well. What God is doing is hopping over the Israelite houses. It's an undignified word. As if to say that what you're experiencing during that night is the fullness of vertigo. It's the fullness of not knowing what is happening as it's happening. God is behaving in a way like you as if you're projecting on God a certain kind of lack of lack of composure. You know, it's a this sudden movement into the air. And in that sense, we have Yitzhak Mitzrayim, the moment of Exodus, the internal moment of Exodus, before they're actually walking out in good order, defiant order, there is a stage of disorder. There's a stage of not having things under control. And God, in some sense, also, Number seven on your page gives us the Mechilta, and I'm just going to paraphrase the essential moment there. It's in English as well, so you can, you can check on me. 
who's panic haste? It says you shall eat it in panic haste. Well, that seems to apply to you. On the other hand, later in the book of Deuteronomy, we will read, for in haste you left the land of Egypt. Whose haste? The exodus happened in whose panic haste? And so there's an argument among the sages. Is the Israelites panic haste? Is the Egyptians haste to get them out of there quickly because their firstborn are dying? And then a third view, chipazon shchina. The haste, the panic haste of God himself. And here you have a highly anthropomorphic description of God from the Song of Songs. Like the lover in the Song of Songs. What happens there, you remember? Kol dodi The voice of my beloved, here he comes, skipping over the mountains, leaping over the hills. Behold, he stands outside our houses, outside our walls, peering in through the windows, peeping in through the cracks. Now, this is a lover of a certain order. It's a certain kind of lover, not the God lover who deigns to, to love the, poor, the poor, poor maiden. This is the lover who is embarrassed and overwhelmed by the passion he experiences. So that he leaps and he sips, skips and jumps. There's a kind of, uh, what's the word I want? Syncope, you know, it's a missed beat of the heart. A sense of not having things under control. His heart is beating so hard. He's leaping over realities and over obstacles because the one thing he knows is that he has to, he has to make a covenant with this. He has there has, there has to be a meeting between himself and his beloved, and he hangs bashfully outside the house, peering in through the cracks. Now, this description actually, it's a description of a certain state of being which is a state of God himself. God is being most ungodlike. God as the shchina, as that aspect of God which we can relate to. It's part of our own deep lives. And what we have here is the Exodus as coming out of a very unquiet state. It comes out of a state of great desire, which is not stable. It's not something that just will go on and on forever. It's intense, an intense moment. It's an unjustified moment in a way, <coughs> without any clear closure, without any clear sense that it's coming to, um, what's the word I want? Fulfillment, you know, clear fulfillment. <coughs> Here is, when I say syncope, I mean physical accidents, physical spasms, you know, like hiccups, a cough, a sneeze, a laughing, when you are, your body is taken over by something you can't control. And in that moment, you miss a beat, your heart misses a beat, time falters, there's a sense of things not going in the rational way that one would actually ultimately like. But that's not the way of Yitzhak and Sway. I want to bring in an, a final image now from Bialik in his famous essay on revealment and concealment. It's an interesting translation. Revealment and concealment. He says, what is poetry? What is poetry like? He says, it's like someone who skips. Bialik was very well versed in Kabbalah and in Midrash. It's like someone who skips from ice flow to ice flow on a rapidly moving river. Now you've got the picture. You have these blocks of ice that have broken up from each other. And he, now the poet is leaping over the deathly river, <laughs> over the dark river, onto the next ice flow. If the ice were completely unbroken, then you would have no access to the rapidly moving river. It would be under total control You'd be telling a perfect cliche of a story. But if you're writing a poem rather than telling a cliched story or telling a poetic story, perhaps, then you are very aware that you are constantly taking into your controlled story the uncontrollable. That somewhere that is part of, it's part of the movement. It's what makes you move, in fact, which is what the Swatimet says in the final passage on your page. 
where he says basically, the people left in Chipazon, the people left in this kind of panic haste, which means in a way that they couldn't pay good, full, conscious attention to what was going on, to what God wanted of them. They were in some kind of altered state. And that's why it's a commandment to tell the story. Not they didn't have a commandment. We have the commandment. We have the commandment to take that poetic material, that material of the raw experience, and make it into a story, each time a different story. Revelation comes to us each year, each generation, in a different way. Because there is that volatile element in it. It's not a fixed story. And in that sense, we make Torah for all generations, a beautiful expression that he uses, that we actually are creating the Torah in this, in this mode. We are creating the meaning of telling the story. And we're saying it's not telling a hackneyed story with a predictable ending. It's a story that allows itself some of that, some of that jar on the nerves, some of that inner sense of something violent, uh, I'm going to finish with that note exactly, something, a, a moment of revelation, a moment of revelation which breaks through the clear surface. Um, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm now going to be, I, it seems I'm going to be having a discussion, Rabbi Baker. <coughs> Well, note to self, what not to put after one of your classes is a discussion. I, I, I need to say that I feel, uh, you know, lecha dumya tihila, you know, the appropriate moment of response to this is at least a little time in silence um, and, uh, and quietude or perhaps unquietude to just kind of take in, um, you know, the kind of, the, what I think might've been the anti-narrative that you just wove so I need to say with humility that we're going to spend maybe 20 minutes or so um, in conversation, but I'm super mindful that while my, um, while my Pharaoh mind wants to resist the nuance and complexity that you just wove and turn it into some concrete Q and A, um, it feels it doesn't do justice to what you just talked about. It would be almost a tragic irony. So I guess I would say, I'd love to be in this with you playfully for, for 20 minutes or so. And um you know, I just scribbled down so many thoughts and um, threw out all the questions I had written beforehand, um, which I should have known. Um, so thank you, first of all. That was just so inspiring. And um, when I opened and said, you don't always know exactly what you're saying, but you know how it feels to be in it with you. Uh, that was true to the experience that I've had every time I've learned with you. So thank you. Um, and I hope that this conversation will not do that experience um, injustice. So let me start, Dr. Zornberg, uh, with a question about the content. And what I'd love to do is to kind of move back and forth a little bit, maybe between content and process, and, and ask you also to reflect a little bit on what you're seeing. You alluded to this in our world today. Um, and so we'll try to hit on all three. But let's start with content. Uh, I'm curious about redemption, uh, a small topic. And, 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 and the exodus, and I'll try to build on what you said. Um, you, you said, I think the exodus is kind of coming out of the unquiet, that the exodus is, is emerging out of a kind of chita zone or an unsettledness. And I guess I'm wondering whether in your mind, it's a coming out of the unquiet such that redemption is the resolution or some kind of respite from the um, almost torment of the unquiet mind, or whether it's actually a coming into the unquiet in a new way and learning to almost kind of like hold the unquiet gracefully or in some other way. Like what is redemption in this model and what is um, the exodus? Um, I think the second alternative, I don't think it's a respite. I don't think it involves redemption, can't involve just forgetting the past and forgetting the unquietness, forgetting the slavery. That is, that in some sense, redemption has to subsume. It has to, it has to include in itself, I wouldn't even say the memory of the past, but the inner experience, which is part of my experience. And I'm thinking here of, let's say, even colloquial uses of the idea of redemption, you know, how we, how we are when we look for redemption, that we on the one, on one, at one moment we are extremely troubled, 
And then at another moment, we seem to find some kind of peace. And if it's not just to be a kind of cover up or a denial of our true experience, then it has to somehow include that, that peace is a, it's a peace that has motion going on in and under it. I think that image, Bialik's image of the, of the rapidly moving river. So in our time, I think we experience that. We experience mm -hmm. it on certain occasions with the COVID. Uh, we, I mean everyone, it's kind of a collective we, uh, more or less, some, some more and some less, experience great uncertainty, a sense of panic sometimes, uh, other feelings that are not easy. And if we achieve some kind of peace of mind on occasion, um, I don't think it's final, you know, because redemption is usually not final, usually until that final redemption at the end of days. Um, and so it provides, I wouldn't say a respite, but a bringing together of experience. It's, it's, it's Winnicott's play in which the fear and the omnipotence and, and the anxiety and everything in a way get played out together and there is a, there's a movement of life. What I love about that is it's, it's not, what you're describing about kind of almost the linear narrative components that it has to kind of incorporate or integrate the past is also true about the experiential, spiritual, emotional, existential, which is if you're longing for a kind of quiet peacefulness that is truly the absence of any tension or conflict, that's not actually what you may get. You may get a kind of a playful ability to live with that, but there's going to be something generative and dynamic even about the rest. I guess maybe that's the connection between Shabbat and Chashua and Plaything too. I wanted to also note the Bialik image that how powerful that the, the solid ground you're jumping on is ice. Yes. You know, in addition to the river flowing, the kind of the paradox of the of the ice being the solid ground. Okay, what do you, what yes. do you think of that? Wow. Um, yes, um, it it does it does smack of a certain skepticism about <laughs> so-called solid ground. Mm. <laughs> the conscious the conscious life of human beings is a kind of pretension. You know that we. Uh, it's it's very necessary and important for us to attain that, that that grip on things, but at best it's a slippery grip. That it, uh, yeah, something like that. I, th I think perhaps Bialik had that in mind in the image. The, illu the illusion of solid ground. Yes, yes, yes. It's like the total. It's like the, the 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 emptiness and void that's that is beneath the world. But, but at any the crust of, of, of what God made, the earth that God made, he made it out of tohu. He made mm. it, it's a very similar idea. The tohu is just underneath a thin crust. Can I ask you about your process a little bit? Because I, it's not lost on probably anyone that, you know, it, the way that you write and teach, I, I, I feel is itself a version of the kind of mitzvah of storytelling that you talked about today and learning to kind of take the the, the tohu vavohu, the, the, um, the kind of the chaos and to make not a linear, concrete, simplistic order out of it, but in some ways, maybe some kind of anti-narrative out of it. Um, you know, can you talk a little bit about your, your own process of teaching and learning and the degree to which it is a healing one for you? You know, how, how, how do you do this? And, and, and uh, if you don't mind me asking a personal question, kind of like, how is it connected to your own experience of these concepts? Um, of, uh, you know, of, of poetry and story and, uh, and, and unquiet and quiet? That is a very good question. And um, it's a huge question um, because that's what I do all the time. Um, and it includes the process starts off with, in a way, with real unquietness. Um, with not having an idea where I'm going, mm. um, taking a text that I'm interested in, in the, in the Parsha, if I'm teaching the Parsha of the week, and starting to learn everything I can find about it. That's, that's how each year gets made. I just, I, I, just, I don't ask a question and then look for answers. I look at all the questions and answers that are there in the world out, out there. 
that have been asked. And something, the residue of all that, you know, as I'm doing it, I don't know where I'm going, which is quite anxiety provoking because I have to teach, you know, on Tuesday or whatever it is. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and then there is an unconscious process. That's all I can say, or I can use religious language to say that, you know, if God wants order, then he sure makes sure it, it emerges from disorder. That mm. is, and that's my experience. That's the only way I can do it. It's the only way I can do it is by exposing myself to that anxiety, which I feel every time. It's, I never feel assured. And then God is with me in some, in some way, partly when I've actually written my notes, I can I have a sense of a structure, but it doesn't become real till I'm actually teaching. Mm. So I'm anxious till the moment I teach um, because I don't know what's going to happen. You know, I have thorough notes, but I, it has to be in here. It has to be here. It can't, I can't look at my notes so much. So it's a, it's a, it's a feeling of great gratitude and great joy when it happens. You know, it feels like an organic process as far as I can experience it. Maybe the process that artists have sometimes, uh, but um, yeah, that's the story. <laughs> that's that, that I think is, and it, it has something of the poetic about it, you know, consciously including the anxieties somewhere. That's part of it. I can't help but notice it has something of the psychoanalytic inside of it too, in terms of yeah. the way that you describe the process. Yes, yes. And it comes from my desire to, to understand who and what I am, um, mm. because I feel in that way my humanity uh, it links me to other people. That, that's the link that I have with other people when I can do that with people. That's an incredible, thank you for sharing that. Um, boy, that desire to know who and what I am. And I would also add, though you didn't say this, the deep curiosity about, you know, as you said, who and what others are. And, and also I think you apply that kind of like deep, dialogical curiosity to the text as well. It's just something so needed in our world today. And um, it just feels like I think about Boel Parot as you described it, you know, this call of like, you know, come with empathy to the exact person who you would think has nothing to teach you and not only learn about him, but learn about yourself in that process. Yeah. And, and I'm just struck by the world we're living in today and how quick we are to to flatten people out and simplify people and, and, and reduce texts. And God, this is a kind of a thickening process that is incredibly powerful. Okay, I'm gonna ask you one more question and stop talking, which is about our world today. Um, you described, and this is either Lear or Freud or some combination of them, the kind of tragic irrationality of the human mind um, that, oh gosh, that does not arouse that how it is that the irrationality itself does not arouse wonder or something like that, yes. forgive me. Yes. And um, of course that is the part of us that not only isn't wondering at the irrationality of the human mind, but it causes us suffering, right? And torments us. Yes. Yes. Um, and it does feel like we are, we are experiencing in our world, well, for sure a lack of wonder and curiosity um, and a kind of a, a tightening of the fists a kind of a hunkering down, whether that's politically or culturally, you know, our stance toward resistance or the other is, is not evoking wonder. Let me put it that way. And I guess my question for you, which you can answer from any angle you want, theological, psychoanalytic, literary, how can we inhabit a space of greater wonder when we come up with, when we come up against a kind of resistance and, and, and brokenness in our world. That's hard to answer. I don't know if I have uh, rules of thumb, but um, somehow loosening, somehow refua, the Hebrew word for healing, it has to do with loosening, loosening something, rafe. You know, it's sort of mm. anything that will do that. Anything, a meditative practice, um, for me, music, absolutely, uh, poetry, Wh whatever 
gets you away from that rigid place, which can also be a place of attacking yourself. It's not only, it's not only a hardness to others, it's hardness to oneself sometimes. Mm. Uh, and the need to find a more liquid place, you know, the rapidly running waters, even if one doesn't yield to them entirely, um, they have to be there somehow. Mm. It's life. It's life rather than thoughts about life. Perhaps. Yeah. I think that's a beautiful note and it's, I'm, 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 I'm mindful that it's 126 and I'm inclined to kind of end on that note and take that last answer as a blessing from you to all of us, um, which is, you know, I think there is a sense, and I said this in my opening, that we are emerging right now. I think we are in a bit of an exodus from COVID moment and you can feel the chippa zone, the that kind of confusion and it's anything but linear because even though we can see a light at the tunnel, we know that even the positive motion is gonna come with a kind of loss and it's gonna be backwards and forwards. And so weathering that with a kind of looseness, I love that. And um, allowing ourselves to find playfulness and to laugh at ourselves, which we know laughter is transcendent kind of even in the conflict you know, has a healing power and may help us somehow make meaning out of the chaos. And I think that's a very powerful blessing to leave us with today. And I'll just say thank you. Thank you for, for your Torah always um, and for uh, being our teacher and for being with us today. And thank you again to my colleagues, of course, and to the Rudermans and to Sharon uh, and to the Rabbinical Assembly. And thank you all for being here, carving out an hour and a half during the day. I hope everyone felt that the medium was the message here. Um, and that we were kind of in it together. Um, and I think in a, in a world that is so deeply divided where so many of us are looking for moments of meaning and opportunities to connect that it, carving out time like this just to be together and learn together uh, and to make meaning together um, and to find ways to be playful um, kind of with one another really to me is, is the stuff that uh, a generative, purposeful community uh, is, is made of. So I look forward to many more opportunities to learn together uh, and to continuing uh, to build communities of learning and action and meaning and purpose and connection uh, with all of you. Thank you so much.